We have an almost intuitive understanding of the relationship between light and temperature. After all, if you are looking at a stove and the stove is turned on, well, it it's not going to be any different than it would look if the stove were turned off if the temperature is not particularly high. But as the temperature increases, then you see that characteristic red glow about the stove, if particularly if it's an electric stove. And then if it were to continue to increase, it would eventually glow a bright yellowish white, much like the flame of the candle seen here. So we already are aware of this relationship, but let's explore it a little bit further. And before we get into the relationship between light and temperature, let's just talk briefly about what temperature itself really means. If we think about a box of gas, and the gas has molecules or atoms of air, essentially, we can think that the temperature is that which allows the molecules to move. The molecules will move relatively slowly when the temperature is cool, but if we were to increase the temperature, the molecules begin to move uh, much quicker. Now, as these molecules move, the atoms uh, collide with one another or scatter off one another. Uh, that allows the electrons to release energy and produces what we think of as heat. Let's also talk briefly about how we measure temperature. There are the two familiar methods of measuring temperature, Fahrenheit and Celsius. In astronomy, we often will use the Kelvin scale. And the Kelvin scale is characterized as zero Kelvin means absolute zero. In other words, it would mean that there is no motion or thermal motion whatsoever. So this is the lowest theoretical temperature that nature could conceivably achieve. However, in reality, even nature itself doesn't exactly reside at zero Kelvin. Empty space, devoid of all the planets, devoid of all the stars, devoid of everything, will still have a characteristic, what we call a background temperature of about 2.73 Kelvin. But this is our, our scale of choice in astronomy. And another thing we should consider as we explore the relationship between temperature and uh, radiation is another object that also does not exist in nature. It's called a black body. So it's a purely theoretical object. These are not real, uh, but they have the characteristic of being what's called a perfect absorber. In other words, if you shone a uh, light upon it, it doesn't matter what color it is. Every wavelength of light, or I should say every wavelength of electromagnetic radiation from gamma all the way down to the longest conceivable radio waves are 100% absorbed. Uh, but uh, once they heat up to some temperature, then they become a perfect radiator. So everything that was absorbed is re-radiated back out in, into space. So again, it radiates at all wavelengths. So while a black body does not truly exist in nature, in fact, uh, a lot of people, when you talk about this uh, theoretical object, confuse them quickly with a black hole. And black holes are not theoretical. They are real objects. Uh, but these black bodies are otherwise theoretical. So why do we use a black body? Well, it's much the same reason that we use the celestial sphere or the Bohr model of the atom. They're not exactly representative of what is truly taking place in nature, but they are once again one of these useful fictions that allow us to understand the nature, or in this case, the relationship between temperature and radiation much better. So let's have a play with these black bodies, and let's imagine now we're going to heat our black body up. So we're going to give it a temperature. In this case, it's about 3600 Kelvin. The atoms inside the temperature begin to move a lot quicker. The, uh, the atoms collide or scatter, and the electrons release energy. And since they radiate at all wavelengths, they release energy at all wa wavelengths. So we see that energy is being released at every wavelength from gamma all the way to the longest radio waves, but they radiate mostly at a peak wavelength. In this case, the peak wavelength is somewhere in the infrared. Now let's take that, let's take that same black body, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, zoom out, you might say, so we're going to increase our scale, and now we're going to heat up the black body till it reaches 5500 Kelvin. Well, notice again, it radiates at all wavelengths. In fact, it outradiates the 3600 Kelvin black body at every single wavelength, except 
now the peak has shifted to somewhere in the middle of the visible spectrum. So if we were to look at this black body, it would now be appearing to glow white. But if we zoom out again, and we increase the temperature of our black body to 8,000 Kelvin, once again, we outradiate the previous two black bodies at every possible wavelength, but now the peak wavelength is somewhere in the ultraviolet. So these theoretical curves, you might say, are called Planck curves, or sometimes black body curves, and simply it's just a relationship between the black body's intensity at every wavelength when heated to a given temperature. Okay, so much for theory. So what is it in nature that comes close or is even similar to a black body once heated to some temperature above absolute zero? And it turns out that just about anything that has uh, some density to it and some temperature radiates very much like these theoretical black bodies. So that could be our sun, it could be a light bulb, but it could also be you or your cat or anything else. Anything that has enough density to it and is above absolute zero will generally radiate in a matter that is similar to these theoretical black bodies. So again, black bodies will radiate at all wavelengths, but they're going to radiate mostly at some peak wavelength. And you see a, a clear relationship here, that the higher the temperature, the more energy is radiated at all wavelengths, the shorter the peak wavelength. So the black body's peak wavelength is inversely proportional to its temperature. Okay, so let's take this one apart. We can express this a little bit more mathematically as the peak wavelength is equal to some constant divided by its temperature. So the constant is known as Wien's displacement constant, named after the person who discovered it. It's just some number, but this law is called Wien's law. And in English, we could just say that the hotter an object is, the bluer it will appear. So let's take a look at a well-known object, our sun. Well, the peak wavelength is somewhere in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum at about 520 nanometers. We know this because, number one, we can read it off of our plot, but number two, it, the sun has a characteristic surface temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. So you plug that into the equation and you get a result that is very well demonstrated on the graph here. And by the way, notice that the sun radiates most of its energy in the middle of the visible part of the spectrum. And what do you know? We happen to uh, have eyes that are sensitive to what we call the visible part of the spectrum. It's no surprise that our eyes have evolved to take advantage of the most abundant form of electromagnetic radiation available to us. Now this means that we can take a look at colors of stars and use them as a way of kind of gauging their temperature. So for example, let's take a look here in the constellation of Orion. Uh, the two brightest stars are uh, Betelgeuse in the upper left armpit of Orion. Betelgeuse has a red color and therefore it has a relatively low temperature. But Rigel, shining in the lower right kneecap of Orion, is blue in color, therefore it has a higher temperature. So hot objects radiate more at all wavelengths, and there's a way to describe just how much radiation is coming out of an object by limiting the energy going through a fixed unit area of the object every second. Now, what do I mean by a unit area? Well, typically that means a fixed area that we all agree is going to be our fundamental reference measurement area. So one square meter, for example. So the amount of energy going through a square meter of area per second is something we call flux. It's energy flow. So we can express that mathematically as flux is equal to a constant multiplied by the temperature raised to the fourth power. This is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. And the Greek letter sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Once again, just a number here. But the thing to consider in this example is the object that is at 10,000 Kelvin is twice the temperature of the 5,000 Kelvin object. That means that the flux uh, out of a 10,000 Kelvin object is 16 times the flux of the 5,000 Kelvin object. Why? Because 
2 in this case, it's a factor of 2 in temperature, 2 raised to the fourth power is 16. So even a slight increase in temperature results in a huge increase in flux. Now, what about the flux coming out of the entire surface area of the star? Well, that's just something called the luminosity. And it's just the energy leaving the entire surface every second. So we can write it like this, and I like to think of this as the star equation, because it tells us so much about the star. So the luminosity of the star is the surface area of the star, which is to say a sphere, and we know that a sphere's surface area is 4 pi, its radius squared, multiplied by the flux, in this case, sigma times the surface temperature of the star raised to the fourth power. So this results in a number that we commonly measure in watts, and yeah, it's the same watts that you see on light bulbs. So to say this in English, the hotter or larger the star is, the more luminous it is. So let's take a closer look at the relationship between luminosity and temperature. Since luminosity is proportional to the flux, or proportional to the temperature to the fourth power, an 8,000 Kelvin star is going to be much more luminous at every wavelength than a, fi than a 5,500 Kelvin star. So the hotter, the more luminous. However, if we shrink the radius of the 8,000 Kelvin star, well, now its luminosity decreases because the luminosity is also proportional to its radius squared. As a matter of fact, if we increase the radius of the cooler star, we can increase the luminosity of the cooler star and even let it outshine the hotter star at many wavelengths. So the luminosity and radius goes as simply as the larger the star, the more luminous it's going to be. So here's another way of looking at it. We have two stars. In fact, one of them is our sun. And for the sake of argument, we'll just say that their surface temperatures are both 5,000 Kelvin and their radii are both one solar radius. So the luminosity of the star is equal to the luminosity of our sun. But if we were to increase or double the radius of the star, of the star well, that means that we can compare the two luminosities and we can just cancel out the common values. Uh, the temperatures are the same, so with those two cancel. So we're really left with just the radius of the star relative to the radius of the sun, both squared. Well, that means that since the radius of the star is twice the radius of the sun, well, the two radii squared cancel, and now the luminosity of the star is exactly four times the luminosity of the sun. Now, if we just bring the star back to its original radius and merely double its temperature, well, then we're back to this factor of 16 increase in luminosity because twice the temperature raised to the fourth power is equal to 16. Betelgeuse and Rigel both have very approximately the same luminosities, and yet we've already shown that Betelgeuse has a lower surface temperature. Yet, because Betelgeuse has a larger radius, that's able to help it compensate uh, for its overall lower temperature, thus the two stars have roughly similar luminosities.